Today we're talking about some of the more controversial topics when it comes to using the squat, namely so the back squat, as a staple of your training. Let's start with depth. How deep should you squat? What is the more optimal way of approaching the back squat? So as with most things, I think it's first important to determine what our goals are. If your goal is in the hypertrophy realm, there's enough data backing the fact that taking the movement through its full range of motion will provide better activation for both your knee extensors and your hip extensor muscles, namely so the quads and the glutes. Both the quads and the glutes will see a better stretch towards the bottom end of the range. So if your goal is hypertrophy and muscle activation, you should be thinking about taking the squat to a full depth. I think most people will agree with this. I can tell you from an anecdotal perspective that for me at least that is the case. And I don't think a lot of people will disagree with that. Hey, so I realized as I was editing that what I said is not quite correct. Yes, for the quads, it is true. You do need to take the squat to its full range of motion to get the most out of the movement. And it is true that we do seem to see better glute activation during a deep squat as well. But there's a few factors that we need to take into consideration. For the most part, it seems to be that loading is the main contributor to proper glute activation during the squats. And the fact of the matter is that the glutes will only be fully contracted when the hips are fully open. And in the case of the squat, that happens only at the very top, which would be considered like our rest. So from a biomechanical perspective, the squat is just not the best of movements to work on your glutes. So if your goal is hypertrophy, just know that there are other things and better movements that you can use in order to maximize, maximize glute hypertrophy, namely so bridges, hip thrust, and those sort of things. Now, when it gets tricky is when we talk about performance in athletics. So from an athletics perspective, what is better? Again, data seems to point to the fact that a full depth squat might still be better, but there's a bit of a caveat here. I think for most athletes, it is important to be able to do a full depth squat, but this does not mean that you need to do it on a consistent basis. We do seem to have better all around activation when we are forced to stop the movement at 90 degrees. But in order for this to be effective, at least in my opinion, it is important to be able to perform a full depth squat. Otherwise, you're not really stopping at 90 degrees, you're simply maxing out your range. It does seem to be the case that the act of stopping your momentum and then having to restart the movement on the way up has a very carryover to other aspects of performance. So for most athletes in general, I say that yes, you should be able to perform a full depth squat with a decent amount of weight, okay? But this does not mean that you need to be doing it on a consistent basis. And for most of your training, you might be better suited by a parallel squat. Finally, I have not seen any meaningful justification in both the literature and from my anecdotal experience as a coach and athlete to give quarter squatting or partial squats any sort of meaningful consideration. I think it's a poor argument to try to say that because the positions are similar, they will translate better. Like, as a coach, I don't think it's proper for me to say that I am trying to get you faster by using the back squat. All I'm trying to do is get you stronger and create a foundation upon which we will build speed. Okay, if you want to get faster, if you want to jump higher, you need to be running fast and you need to be jumping high. You need to stop treating your speed sessions or your jumping sessions as conditioning. Okay, and you just need to focus on those, ma on those max effort outputs. When it comes to the work in the gym, it is meant to be non-specific because we are trying to build strength and the back squat just seems to be the better movement for all around strength and athletic performance. Like it will just have a better carryover to other aspects of fitness, not just jumping and sprinting. And trying to overload a partial squat just doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. There's a pretty interesting paper from 2012 that looked at the back squat, the front squat, and the quarter squat. And what they ended up determining was that the back squat and the front squat had a better carryover into jumping than the quarter squat. And also into the quarter squat itself. 
Meanwhile, the quarter squat didn't really have a carryover to anything beyond just quarter squatting. So in terms of specificity, it would just be better for you to simply get stronger in the off season and then continue your training as regular and get better at the skills of jumping and sprinting rather than trying to like shortcut that work by using something that is more similar or might have a more like specific effect in the gym. Now maybe some special consideration can be given to things like heavy walkouts, heavy jerk dips, or heavy rack holds. But we need to understand that when we see this, they're being performed as accessory work. They do not take the place of proper strength work carried out through the full range of motion on any given movement. They're added with a specific goal into the program in order to prepare the athletes for something. So keep that in mind next time you see something like this in social media. The next one is the knees over the toes. This was a big one growing up and I'm kind of surprised that it still might be a big one in some circles. I always get shocked when I hear people talking about this being a bad thing. I would assume after the knees over toes guy became like pretty mainstream, this would have gone out the window, but apparently it hasn't. So I think this whole thing got started by some papers or some um, studies showing that by allowing the knees to go past your toes, you're increasing the shear forces or the torques at the knee, which could be considered a bad thing. An interesting study done on this back in 2003 looked at restricting the knees from going over the toes and allowing the knees to go over the toes. And what, end up, what they end up finding was that, yes, by allowing the knees to go past your toes, you are in fact increasing the torque forces around the knee joint. But when you stop yourself from doing that, you end up increasing the torque forces at your hip and low back considerably more. As you can see in the table here, yes, you might be reducing the forces by 20% at the knee, but you're literally increasing the forces at the hip and at your low back 10 times a thousand percent. So I don't think that's worth the risk. Take the example from thousands of weightlifters that literally squat on every single training session, five, six days a week, allowing their knees to go past their toes every single day. Most of us are not doing that. Yes, a lot of them might end up developing knee issues later on their careers, but that is simply due to the volume. You're gonna be fine with just one or two sessions a week, allowing your knees to go past your toes. Next up is knee valgus. Now, this is really not that big of a deal, especially if it's happening only at maximal loads. Now, if it's part of your regular movements, if without any load, you're still seeing your knees buckle, like it should be addressed and it should be a reason for concern and you should look into why it's happening. Oftentimes it's just glute medius activations and you can just like go through a proper warm up instead of just jumping into the movements. But for the most part, if it's only happening with maximal loads or loads above like 80, 90%, it shouldn't really be a reason to be concerned. Finally, the topic of shoots, belts, and wraps. I think this is such an interesting topic because I do not understand why people have a fixation of like putting an asterisk next to the list saying that they use a belt or they didn't use a belt. For me, going into a training session, a hard training session, maybe pushing weights, pushing volume, whatever it is, without the proper gear, it's just silly. And I don't know. It'd be the equivalent of wanting to play rugby, wanting to play football, wanting to play lacrosse and not wearing cleats in my opinion at least. Like it's part of the gear, it's part of what you use to perform better. You know, like if you want the best squat that you can get, use gear. Now, if you really do want your best squat, then use the other type of gear as well, but you know, it's whatever. Now, when it comes to the belt, please know that the main point of the belt is to help you bracing. The belt is not gonna do anything for your spine, okay? It is simply giving you a wall to push against. Okay, usually when you don't have a belt, this wall ends up being your sim like your muscles around your transverse abdominis. But oftentimes, and even with heavier loads, it's easier to just have like a genuine like physical layer of hard leather pushing against yourself. If you do wanna be proper, I do not think that you should use your belt on every single set. I think you should save it for anything above 80% and for like very long and tough sets. When it comes to knee wraps and knee sleeves, like those should not be in there to stop you from feeling pain. Like if you're really feeling pain on every squatting session, like you should address whatever is causing you pain. I for one tend to use them more for like uh, warmth and especially in the colder winter months when it gets really cold here in the garage. Like I like having something around my knees just to keep them warm when I'm resting in between sets. And when it comes to shoes, like please just wear weightlifting shoes. Like I don't think there's any point I'm not using weightlifting shoes. They are made for squatting. They are made for the lifts. Okay, I go back to my cleats argument. You know, the added height, yes, 
it's helpful, especially if you're trying to do weightlifting. Like if you're a weightlifter, there's really not excuse, not an excuse to not wear weightlifting shoes. I know that CrossFit made it popular, but Matt Fraser always wore weightlifting shoes if the events were about lifting. You know, they are made for the sport. They help you get in better positions and they help you push better off the ground. And I just think it's a silly topic, like just wear your gear, man. Like literally, the only person putting the little asterisk next to your PR is yourself saying like, well, I wore a belt. Well, I didn't wear a belt. And then that's just being silly. Yeah, that's the video for this week. So hopefully you guys enjoyed it and got something out of it. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Uh, links below are to my programs and to some of the other things that I do. So yeah, thanks for watching. It is important to draw wisdom from many different places. If we take it from only one place, it becomes rigid and stale. Understanding others, the other elements, and the other nations will help you become whole. Thank you.